Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished guests, and esteemed viewers. Welcome to the lecture series of Meet the Scholar program conducted by Internal Quality Assurance Cell of University of Kerala and the Department of Economics, University of Kerala, on the topic Public Policy in India Unmasking the Debates. The invited speaker is respected Professor Surya Narayana, Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. Moving on to the schedule. Uh, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQAC, of Kerala University aims to develop a system for conscious, consistent, and catalytic action to improve the academic and administrative performance of the institution and to promote measures for institutional functioning towards quality enhancement. Hence, I cordially invite eminent lecturer, renowned speaker, and someone who has contributed much to the curricular and extracurricular of the University and Professor in Commerce, Dr. Gabriel Simon Tuttle, Director of IQAC, to deliver the welcome speech. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all. Professor Surya Narayanan, the head of the department, Dr. Anita, other distinguished faculty, students, scholars, and my dear friends. I'm happy to be part of this program which is captioned as Meet the Scholar, which was conceived by IQAC. And I'm again happy that the Department of Economics has identified and invited one of their own alumnus, Professor Surya Narayan, to come and address you on this program. Now, the caption of this program, Meet the Scholar, actually was an idea where we are or where the university is rather trying and uh, it is attempting to see that it gets to learn from the best practices from different institutions. So the idea is to learn what's happening across to identify best practices which we can incorporate in our own university, try to see uh, good practices in research, good practices in publication, good practices in creation of intellectual property, try to have collaborative work and try to create a synergy for development. So it is with this objective that we have had this series of lectures on Meet the Scholar. Originally, it was on the offline mode where the scholars used to visit the university and interact with students, teachers, and scholars. Now, post or Based on the pandemic, we are trying to have it in the online mode. So we are rather fortunate. And in fact, uh, it's a matter of great pleasure that we have with us Professor Surya Narayanan, who is here to address you on uh, the theme chosen, which is public policy. And he is going to address you, a, 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 a most appropriate person, to address scholars and learners in economics on uh, this particular theme. Now, as far as Mr. Surya Narayanan is concerned, he is the chair for Indian studies in the Indian Council of Cultural Relations. He is also a development economist who has done a lot of works in terms of poverty, food policy, and so on and so forth. He has been a member and faculty of Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research since 1988. And he has formulated numerous uh, policies and supported policy making bodies in terms of uh, the food policy. And he has also been the editor of the Indian Journal of Agriculture Economics. Uh, as far as his experience in consultancy is concerned, he was a consultant at the Ministry of Industry and uh, the, under the Planning Commission, Government of India and has been a visiting fellow at the uh, Fellow for Economic Growth Center in Yale University, and also a senior economic advisor at the International Poverty Center under UNDP. He has got his own uh, contributions as a consultant for ADB, OECD, UNDP, and the World Bank, and has done lots and lots of work in terms of agriculture economics, econometrics, food policy, poverty elevation, and so on and so forth. So I think it would be a happy homecoming uh, 
for him as well so professor surya narayan and it will be a glad occasion for the learners from our side to interact with him learn with him and try to make their learning more focused in terms of policy formulation in terms of application in terms of looking at the real world or trying to integrate what is learned from the books to what is happening in the society so professor surya narayan on behalf of the internal quality assurance cell on behalf of the university and above all on behalf of all at the department of economics with great pleasure we extend a very very warm welcome to you uh, along with professor surya narayan and joining is the team of teachers faculty members from the department of economics and the other research scholars in social sciences economics and other subjects so also the students who are pursuing their masters i hope you will draw from what is being shared today you will learn immensely and this will help you in trying to integrate your learning with substantial amount of research and input for intellectual uh, property in terms of having something genuine to research upon to publish and to build upon so i extend a warm welcome to all the teachers all the scholars students delegates who are attending this program and with these words of welcome allow me to conclude thank you so much thank you sir now it's time to move on to our lecture uh, simon sir has already given a brief introduction about our lecturer yet as a part of formal introduction professor surya narayana an alumnus of the department of economics university of kerala to phd from indian statistical institute and has been a faculty member at indira gandhi institute of development research since 1988 he is a development economist with vast experience in providing technical assistance in preparing human development reports poverty reduction strategy papers and tracking millennium development goals he has served as the indian council of cultural relations chair in indian studies at the king's india institute london visiting fellow at the economic growth center yale university senior economic advisor at the international poverty center undp brasilia he was the editor of the indian journal of agricultural economics he has served as a consultant for adb oecd undp and the world bank and provided technical assistance to various developing country governments such as international consultant for undp somalia senior trainer consultant for the fao training workshop on analysis of data for measuring availability access and nutritional status under national food policy capacity strengthening program at the bangladesh academy for rural development he also served as a member of several expert panels of icssr and the union and state governments in india i humbly welcome professor surya narayana to begin the lecture sir please thank you, mm, th thank you uh, professor simon for your uh, kind introduction and also welcome and also um, suppose you can hear me right and i in fact as professor simon has already pointed out it is essentially something like homecoming for me as you know the department of economics or the university of kerala it is my alma mater i am mean, excited to come and talk to the students it is a great uh, feeling for me i feel quite nostalgic and uh, i thought i'll just share with you my experience of what i learned from the department of economics and how i progress in my career in terms of policy formulation and understanding i think this is what i would like to say let me begin you now i'll share with you, um, to facilitate my presentation i think i'll just share my ppt let me know whether it's coming
físicamente, ¿no? Can you, can you see the PPT? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me know what I'm going to uh, talk on, as Professor Saman has already pointed out. I thought I'll just talk on public policy in India. Okay. And uh, I'll just see what sort, of, um, what sort of debates we have been having in India. Okay. And um, before I really make my presentation, I would like to pay my tributes to my teachers at the department, Professor P.G.K. Panika, Professor E.T. Matthew, Professor P.R. Gopinathan Nair, Professor Uman, Professor Ibrahim, Professor Radhakrishnan. And uh, I, I learned the mathematical statistics or used to be called advanced statistics from Professor Kalyan Raman from the Department of Statistics. I owe a lot, to, I'm heavily indebted to all these teachers who taught, taught me the fundamentals. In fact, I should uh, lay and play, place on the record my gratitude to Professor Radhakrishnan, who taught me elementary mathematics, statistics, and econometrics. In fact, you know, I would like to tell you, I, I am an undergraduate from the government college, Gasragur, and I was a student of history and political science and economics. I didn't know any mathematics. It was Professor Radhakrishnan who taught me the even elementary mathematics, and I picked up statistics, econometrics, and I teach econometrics now at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development. At this point of time, I also would like to you know thank my classmates, particularly Mr. Professor Kabir, or possibly you all of you may be knowing, he's a teacher in the University College. He was. And uh, Professor, uh, my friend Kuruvila and others, who met my own classmates, who made my pursuit of econometrics and uh, pursuit of you know the PG course at the Karyavat a very enjoyable experience. And uh, among my seniors, definitely I would like to hi highlight my friends like Professor uh, Dr. N. D. Joy, Professor Satyavati Shuresh, uh, Sanjeev Kumar, and others. And uh, among my juniors, you know, I had my, you, you, all of you must be knowing Mr. Aj Dr. Ajit. With whom I'm in touch, even I'm in touch even now. In fact, all these students and friends, they made my life quite memorable. I think I think I feel really nostalgic when I start addressing you, addressing you today. Fine. Let me tell, tell me what is the motivation for me to choose the topic. I asked Professor Shija what sort of lectures topics people have talked on before. I thought that one of the topics, I think Dr. Deepa Shankar talked on the applications of, you know, use, uh, uses of national sample survey. So I thought I will start from there because now you know what is national sample survey data. And I will just see how the NSS survey has been, particularly national sample survey data on consumer expenditure distribution has been used quite profusely in different policy making exercises of the government of India and also different state governments. But you know, my, my motivation in my presentation today is that to advise the students, you know, please, I know that there's almost like a 50 years gap between, I was a student at Karivatam in during 1976-78. Now we are in the year 2021, you know, there's almost 50 years gap between us. But then, I would like to tell you that, you know, those days, um, and I recently, Ms. Jyoti, one of my juniors, she sent me the photos of the department. They look very similar to the, the good old olden days. But the question is, I don't know, uh, what is the exposure? What is your approach and attitude towards learning economics, theories, and methods? So I thought I should tell you today that, you know, please focus on careful study and appreciation of theories and methods economic theories, statistical methods, and their applications. Why? It is important for you to participate in public policy debate. You, you, you can play a very important role 
in influencing major policy decisions of the government at the state level as well as at the central level. You can ask questions like, how valid are the questions posed in any public policy exercise? What are the issues? How valid are they? What sort of policy measures are adopted? Now, it is very important for you as students to look at these issues. In fact, I would appeal to this, the, the, uh, IQGC, they are, the, the Dr. Shijan and Professor Simon, that you know, we should uh, maybe start, you know, make, make, you know, encourage students to write weekly or monthly newsletters on important public policy issues and display them in your uh, website. I think this will go a long way in uh, training the students on how to write, how to write public policy papers. They don't be big essays with just about 800 words. It will also you know, uh, make the public aware of the important contribution the Department of Economics makes in terms of training the students and in terms of public policy formulation. That is the reason I thought I should talk on this particular topic, that is public policy and the debates unmasked. Fine. Let me just see. When not, what, so what do we mean public policy? I will come to that part. Now, whenever we talk about public policy in India, right from the Independence Day, we can broadly divide the, our entire experience in terms of the pre-reform period and post-reform period. As you know, in 1991, we had the government of India adopted major economic reforms in terms of methods of policy, and so instrumental of implementation of policies, etc. So if you really look at this uh, pre-reform period, we used to discuss a lot on poverty. Measuring deprivation, how do you measure dep deprivation? And how, how do you define minimum, the subsistence minimum? How do you estimate it? How do you quantify it? These are important issues quite often discussed before our, our reform period. Even now, you know, we keep discussing those issues as you know even recently 2012 we had this Algarajan committee to look into the question of defining and measuring poverty again if you we'll go into the some of our fire plans let for example i will talk about the much celebrated six fire plan it adopted a strategy called growth with redistribution it wanted to reduce poverty partly by growth and partly by redistribution it was a great, you know, much applauded fire plan framework. What, what I would like to show you too, what is wrong with this kind of policy formulation? How valid are they? This is what I'm going to discuss with you so that tomorrow you can also, from whatever you learn in your classroom exercises, you can use them and to analyze current contemporary public policy debates and write articles and make useful policy contribution. Fine. You may ask me, what do you mean by public policy? In fact, public policy refers to the, any action or a program undertaken by the government to address an economic issue. It may be poverty in Kerala, or it may be poverty in uh, India, or it could be poverty in Kalakutam or Kariyavattam. So, anyway, so essentially it refers to a set of policy initiatives undertaken by the government or a public body to address certain issues facing the society, facing the public. So when it comes to formulating policies, there are several important steps that we have to observe. Specification. Do we know the problem that we seek to address? It is something like going to a doctor. Imagine the doctor examines is a patient and the doctor doesn't know anything about the disease. He doesn't know anything about the theory. He doesn't know anything about the medicines to be prescribed anything. What he will do? He will simply take the patient. Similarly, an economist, when he makes a public policy formulation, it is quite important to have a good understanding of the concepts and the different criteria to identify or appropriate policy options, to specify targets, etc. This is quite important. 
quite often our policy makers failed on all these issues. Okay, that precisely is what is called, what I call HLC of public policy. Quite often we do not have in, in adequate information base. Imagine you go to your doctor, doctor doesn't doesn't have any information. He may not have anything about your blood, um, blood pressure. He may not have any information about uh, the blood test reports. Uh, how, whether you are anemic, what exactly is haunting you, what exactly is the problem. If there is no information, doctor won't be able to prescribe a medicine. So it is quite important for us and I have a sound information base. That precisely is a major shortcoming of Indian public policy making. That's what I'm going to discuss today. So what are the, what are the weaknesses of Indian public policy? On the other hand, we have information base is very poor. And then even when the information is poor, we don't have a good understanding of the concepts and database methods and measures. Okay. And this is what I'm going to discuss now. Fine. Let me just talk about poverty. And now I, I appeal all the students, if you have any difficulty in following my discussion, please feel free to stop me and ask me questions. Okay, fine. Whenever we talk about poverty, you know, the poverty is a major issue which is facing the country even today. Right from the day we got independence, or even before we got independence, we have been worried about uh, poverty, how to tackle poverty in India. As I told you, just the way a doctor has to define the problem and I did diagnose the problem facing his patient, an economist also has to really define poor poverty. What do you mean by poverty? Who do you call poor? It will be very important to define the concept of poverty. Let me just say, so I will define poverty as inability to attain minimum level of economic welfare. Suppose Surya Narayana cannot attain a certain minimum level of economic welfare, I call it poor. Then the question comes, what do you mean by economic welfare? How do you measure economic welfare? And how would you define minimum economic welfare? If you look at the Indian literature, economic literature, generally we measure economic welfare in terms of income. Because income essentially represents your ability to buy happiness, whatever welfare essentially means happiness. So, in, in some sense, you know, income measures if I, with income, you can buy anything, whatever you want. You know, it, 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 there is no restriction in, um, in, your, in your pursuit of happiness and welfare. So, that's is generally we try to measure, use income as a measure of economic welfare. Now, how would you define this minimum? What is this minimum? So, these are the issues which most of the economists, academic as well as public policy experts, went on discussing in an Indian policy making. I will come to those points now. Second issue is aggregation. So that is, suppose if once you identify the poor, then you have to identify some, obtain a summary measure of their characteristics. How are you defining? So that is what is called aggregation. Much of the policy focus in India has been on these two issues, identification of the poor, and aggregation of their characteristics. How do you obtain a summary measure of poverty? Generally, in India, what we have been doing is simply identify the poor. Call somebody poor if he doesn't have enough income. Maybe you imagine I call something called poverty line 100 rupees. If I Surya Narayana doesn't have income 100 rupees, we call him poor. And you count how many Surya Narayanas are there in your society. If there are no in your society, there are 100 individuals, out of which 50 individuals are. Um, poor, then we call 50% of the population is poor. This is what is called headcount measure of poverty. This is what is how what is the you know how do we mean by aggregation? Fine. This, are, this is how you know if you look at the public policy making in India, generally the focus has been on these two issues: identification and aggregation. But there has been little focus on information base. Where do we have this information? How do I identify the poor? Where are the statistics? How reliable it is? This is, this is the one important area where our academicians as well as policymakers have failed to examine with all careful details. That's precisely what I'm going to show you now. 
Like, before I tell you, I want to tell you, um, you know, there is an important study by Sir Dada Bhai Navroji. Even before we got independence, he published a book called Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. It was published in 1901. I have high admiration for this book and how he went about the problem. Dada Bhai Navroji, in 1901, he didn't have any information base. What was his objective? He wanted to show that the British have ruined India. So much so that India is incapable of providing even, even those minimum subsistence to the population. So how can you prove this? He wanted to prove this hypothesis. His hypothesis is that the British have ruined the country. And he wants to show that India is incapable of providing even the basic subsistence to its population. He didn't have any complicated data information base you know, that we have today. There was no government apparent government apparatus to collect statistics. He didn't have anything. He didn't even attend any course in statistics at Kari Vatam. But you know, he very you know, he's very like novel, no, very novel way of conceptualizing the problem. I really just I appreciate. What he did was that in those days, the British government had used to have a manual to define the minimum consumption bundle that we have to give to coolies, immigrant coolies. Not only immigrant coolies, you know, those, you know, those who used to fight for the Indian freedom, political you know, political, political fighters and everything, the government used to imprison them and send them to, you know, to prisons in Andaban, Nicobar Islands, etc. When they were put in ship and then when they were sent, they, they, used to, they had to give certain minimum consumption. So the government of the British government had used to have a minimum norm, what is called scale of diet. Let's say, the, for example, if you look at this table, it tells you per day how much we should give for a vegetarian and non vegetarian, how much rice you should give, how much dal you should give, everything. So this is the scale of diet, which is, which is the government of the British government specified. To provide to coolies or even political prisoners, etc. So Dada by Dauroji, he didn't know much statistics. Anything. What he did was he just took the scale of diet. He went to the market in different marketplaces, metropolitan cities, okay, major towns and cities in India, and collected prices of rice, dal, etc. And worked out the you know, he value, find out the value of all these items of consumption, which would what is figuring in the scale of diet. So by you know, for the, when the quantities multiply the price, it will give you total value. So he added up the value and what, what is called cost of minimum subsistence. This is what Dr. Dada Bhai Navroji did. So he found out the, what is the average cost of subsistence for an Indian citizen if the government were to provide this minimum consumption bundle for everyone. Then he also made estimates of national income and found and compare the two estimates, the minimum consumption that cost as well as the national income. Then he found that national income in India at that in 1901 or 1950, he made estimates for a couple of years, was much less than the cost of providing minimum consumption to the Indian citizens. So with this statistical information, Dada Bhai Navroji pointed out that the British have ruined this country. Fine. That's how Dada Bhai Navroji, he didn't use much statistical techniques and just with novelly, very, uh, with a lot of imagination, he used available information he used and tried to work out. It's true his point. So let us say, now there is something called, let me just say, what is poverty line? I'm going to just say, now, you know, in India, we have been make, making estimates of poverty, poverty line. Like, as I already told you, somebody who cannot attain the minimum level of economic welfare is called poor. And the cost of, so I said, I can define this minimum level of economic welfare in different ways, in terms of income or in terms of consumption bundle also. For instance, as I, I already shown you, Dada by Navroji defined it in terms of a consumption bundle. Okay. So in India, we have been using this consumption bundle approach for the first time, you know, in, in 19, and 62, an expert group defined a consumption of um, rupees 20 at 1960-61 prices at the poverty line. 
But officially, the government of India defined a poverty line for the first uh, first time in the sixth fire for the sixth fire plan. This is what I want to bring to your attention. What sort of mistakes government or policymakers are committing? You know, so, um, you know already uh, the process. Deepak Shankar has already taught you what is this national sample survey. How do you collect information, etc. Let me just talk about the national sample survey on household consumption distribution. Every year, earlier, almost every year, the national sample survey organization used to conduct a survey of households in India, in both rural and urban sector, at all India level, and also for different states, and collect information about the different items of consumption. Okay. So when they, collect, they used to collect this information for item, different items of consumption. And generally, the whole purpose was to conduct a survey during the agriculture year. Why? India is predominantly, even those days, and even now, even now predominantly an agricultural country. Where, you know, particularly in the 50s or 60s or 70s, almost about, you know, in um, um, uh, more than two thirds of the, even today, more, more than two thirds of the population derives the livelihood from the agriculture sector. And those days, more than two thirds of the state national income was from the agriculture sector. So, what the government of India did was that it is conducted a national sample survey during the agriculture year. What is the agriculture year? From July to June. So, so the, why do you conduct a survey during the agriculture year? That is because there is seasonality. You know, people, people have you know, you know, employment opportunities during the harvest season, during the rainy season, and during the sowing season, etc. But the question is, um, the, they, when they're um, off, during the off-season, they don't get employment, etc. Accordingly, we find that the fluctuations in their employment opportunities, consumption patterns, etc., depending upon the season. So to, to take into account seasonality, the government of India, or the National Sample Survey Organization, used to conduct surveys throughout the agriculture year, July to June. But not always. For instance, for during the, as I show you, look at this slide, during the 28th round, the national sample survey was conducted only during the nine months of the agriculture from October 1973 to June 1974. Incomplete agriculture year. Using such information, they tried to estimate a poverty line for India. In other words, that is unreliable because there is seasonality in your estimate. You cannot use that. Not only that, those of you who learn econometrics must be knowing that in our microeconomic theory also must have heard something called angle function. What is an angle function? It talks about the relationship between either a calorie consumption or food consumption and total expenditure. You try to specify this relationship, and then from that HTML function, you try to estimate the poverty line. Mechanically, our planning commission has done this kind of exercises. Those of you who learn econometrics, those of you who learn economics know that there is something called identification, specification and identification of an econometric spatial regression function. No one has bothered to examine whether these angle functions, which the planning commission has used, are specified, identified, and estimated. But they just estimate something and make estimate come out with a poverty line. Okay. For, for your information, I will tell you, in 1970-74, the Planning Commission came out with an estimate of you know, rupees 49 rupees per capita per month for rural India as the poverty line, and rupees 56 rupees 64 paise as the poverty line for urban India. Since then, we have been making estimates of poverty using these poverty lines. Fine. Why do we need these estimates of poverty? Essentially for policy formulation and policy evaluation. If you know what is the magnitude of poverty in the country, you know what is the amount of resources that have been devoted to eradicate poverty for these you know, deprived sections of the society. Not only that, if you make periodic estimates of poverty, then what you can do, you can also evaluate public policies, whether a five-year plan has been successful in reducing poverty or not. Has poverty increased over time or decreased? Now, if you have estimates of poverty for different years, then you can see whether poverty has declined or increased, and what is how you can you can also make solid statements in terms of policy success. 
you can make recommendations to the government. What is uh, going wrong with the government of it, government policy efforts? Okay. But the question is, people never bothered. Okay, I wanted to refer to another expert group, you know, this Central Committee. Committee. Why I refer to this? I have also done some back concept paper from this Central Committee. Committee. I call it an academic show. You must have seen a Hindi movie called Shole. Where all great actors are there, Amitabh Bachchan, Dharmendra, Sanjeev Kumar, and others. So similarly, in this this Tendulkar committee report, it's almost like a shole. All complicated, you know, non-comparable data sets are combined together, and there's a lot of fire, shopping, etc. But the question is, finally, it comes up with the estimate of power line, it is absolutely meaningless. This is how policies are made in our country. That's what I'm telling you, as students, you should learn this you know, fundamental methods and concepts that you use in your classroom and you apply them in evaluating public policies. OK. After the Tenderloop Committee, let me just say, so let us say, what are the findings of poverty in India? So if you really look at different estimates, they find the poverty has declined in India. There is a general agreement that poverty in India has declined. Of course, if you make year, year, year uh, estimates for different years, you will find that there are fluctuations. There are experts who think to think that these fluctuations are due to agriculture, monsoon dependent in agriculture. You know, sometimes there is a good, good monsoon, so agriculture prosperity is there, so poverty comes down. So there is a bad, there is a drought here, agriculture there, so there won't be employment, wages decline, and particularly landless laborers in the rural sector suffer. So people have tried to you know, observe, explain, observe fluctuation in terms of growth. Agricultural fluctuations, inflation, wages, etc. Let me just provide you a picture. See, this is this I provide you here estimates of poverty, rural poverty in India. From the year 19, ever since we got independence, 1951-52 till 1993-94. You can see that you know the year-wise fluctuations, you know, it's sometimes it's going up, sometimes coming down, again going up, coming down like that. But broadly, if you try to, try to fit a trend line, you'll find that poverty in general has declined. Fine. Okay. The, in the, it is in this context, um, um, Mr. Mo, uh, Montega Hulwalia, he was the deputy chairman of the Indian Planning Commission. He proposed a hypothesis saying that trickle down hypothesis. He said that in India, poverty has declined in, in general. And uh, observed fluctuations are due to observed fluctuations in agricultural performance. Whenever there is growth in agriculture, poverty has declined and vice versa. This is what's called, called trickle down debate. Many experts from foreign universities in, like Cornell, Oxford, IDS Sussex, they also participated in this debate and they make it very complicated uh, how inflation has led to poverty, how wages, wage movements have led to poverty, Poverty, etc. People have done all these kind of exercises, picking regressions, complicated regressions, etc. I'm not going to go into those details. But you know, you don't have to do all these complicated exercises. You don't have to do any regression. I don't have to do all these head count ratios at all. I do. I do a very simple exercise. What I do is, you know, this is the exercise with the Monte Carlo I did. You know, you know, this is this thick line refers to say, you know, it plots the and domestic product in agriculture output in part of head of rural population. And these thin lines refer to poverty line. For example, whenever agriculture de for instance, the agriculture declines, poverty increases, and vice versa. So this is what we call a trickle down debate in India. But let us see. We know statistical methods. Let us see how how valid are these assessments. So I do I don't go fit into regression anything. I take a very simple exercise. What I did was I divided, divided the population into 10 decile groups. For example, if you look at this line, it refers to per capita monthly per capita consumption of the poorest 10% of the rural Indian population. If you look at the second line, it refers to the monthly, it plots the monthly per capita consumption of the second poorest decile group of the rural population, third poorest, like that. So here I have plotted only for about five decile groups of the population, and finally we have the total population. What does it show? This trickle down period, you know, debate has essentially pertained to the period from 1960 61 to 1970 to 72. Look at this graph. 
it doesn't show any increase in real consumer consumption has declined. So if you really look at the national sample survey data, it doesn't show any increase in say, consumption at all. But what happened is much of the policy makers, they simply put some the head country issues, they run some regulations and run really complicated regulations, and they say that there is inflation expectations. So they really make it very complicated. So all these debates make it very complicated and try to confuse the policy maker. And in fact, people have their own agenda. This is what precisely happening. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that you know you don't have to really go into complicated regulations. If you have a very good understanding of basic concepts and a good understanding of simple statistical methods, you don't have to fit a regression. Without regression, you can ask very fundamental questions. My fundamental question is, how valid is the hypothesis that the standard of living of the population has increased as a result of agricultural growth? If I really have to look at the actual consumption bundle, real consumption bundle of the bottom poorest 5% of high decimal groups of the population, I find that there is no growth at all. So, in other words, the whole debate, all the econometric models, estimates, and regressions, and all the publications is just a you know, it's just, you know, misleading debates. They don't mean anything. They're invalid debates. This is why I'm telling you, students have an interest in participating in policy debates. You, with the simple statistical tools, you can ask very fundamental questions. Okay, now I'm going to raise the most fundamental question. What is the most fundamental question? You know, can we use the national sample survey data to make estimates of poverty? I can use it only if the sample data set is representative of the population. To be representative, the data set has to fulfill two important conditions. In other words, you, know, you, you collect information about consumption from a set of sample households. These sample households should be representative of the underlying population. I suppose all of you must have learned in your statistics. So there's one, one important requirement is that this sample of households should be representative of the underlying population distribution. Point one. Not only that, from these households, you collect information about their consumption. These consumption estimates should be representative of the consumption of these households. All our academic experts and also policymakers in India, they examine only the first condition, whether the condition is fulfilled, whether the sample households are representative. Yes, the NSS sample households are representative. That's no doubt about it. So people just complete their exercise there. They went about making estimates of poverty and writing papers and papers and doing it. But the tragedy of public policy research in India is that the estimates of consumption distribution across these also are not representative at all. This is because why? The only important reason is that the NSS sample design is worked out in such a way as to obtain, minimize the reporting error. You know, whether you collect information from a set of sample households, there are two types of errors that we talk about in statistics. One is sampling error. Suppose if this, uh, your sample set of sample households are not representative, we have sampling error. And there is also non-sampling error, which could be anything. One important non-sampling error is a reporting error. If the households from whom you collect information cannot report collect information correctly, then there is reporting error. So our statistical experts, they thought that in the 1950s or 60s, the Indian economy was largely informal. A substantial part of the wage payments used to be in kind. That means you might be, I don't know the correct, I know everything is monetized. Those who in the future, if you seek your talk to your elders, parents or grandparents, they will tell you. In the 50s or 60s, much of the wage payments used to be in kind. If I buy, you know, if a maid servant comes to my house, I don't pay her in cash. I give her breakfast from my prepared food items. I prepare breakfast for myself. I give the same food to my maid servant. And during lunchtime, I just give it, I prepare a chapati or rice or some sambar, everything for myself or for my family. I share it with my maid servants. And even when they go, I just give them a pack of you know, idli or dosa or chapati and everything. Okay, in other words, wage payments used to be in kind. 
the uh, serve workers or maid servants or your laborers in your household or your on your farm they get paid in kind so if you ask them how much chapati you consumed or how much rasam how much rice you consumed they won't tell you they only tell you would be able to tell you that i ate food to my heart's content my stomach was full how many grams of rice you consumed they won't be able to tell you whereas it is only the landlord or the housewife or the landlord who cooks this food she will be able to give precise estimates of the, the amount of food that is cooked in the house that is why to minimize the reporting error the nss investigators they used to collect information only from the landlords not from the laborers or employee households as a result what happened was that as a result, as a result the estimates of consumption of the poor land laborers employee households were underestimated and as a result poverty was overestimated but people never bothered you know people just went on writing research papers taking some numbers and uh, fitting regressions this is a major policy you now i'm telling you major academic failure of indian public experts either not only policy makers but also even this and indian academicians have also failed to understand in other words a first step in any research exercise is to have authenticated the database information base and see how valid they are to verify if we can use such information for your public policy exercise people don't do such things okay let me talk now you so you, know, you have been very silent so let me just you may ask me how do you prove your point i'm saying that because of the peculiar national sample survey design the consumption of the richer landlord house are overestimated and consumption of the poor households are underestimated if you look at nss data set you can see that the richest 10% of the population they consume almost 40 kilos of cereals per month that is more than 1 kilo per day let me ask you a question imagine you consume 1 kilo of rice or chana rice and wheat per day you will die in 3 days no one will be able to digest only if you look at the poorest people you find that they consume less than 7 kg or so per capita per month again just after starvation they should die we won't have faced the population problem at all in india it is really true but the nss data is true i'm even showing you so that i'm taking the nss now this is the table i'm just as um I've taken a copy of it to just show you it gives what it you know if you look at this table for this refers to the year 1961 you can see that as per this data table 1960-61 the poorest expenditure group 0 to 8 it hardly used to consume you know, the, the 30 no, no, combined 10 10 cereals that means you know, something about uh, 8 kilograms of uh, cereals you know, rice jowar bajra everything per capita per month when if you look at the richest 75 plus and if they consume they can used to consume almost 43 cereals that means uh, almost about uh, 38 kilograms of cereals per capita per month which means more than a kilo of rice is it possible in other words, sometimes you know we don't have a good understanding of econometric tools or statistical standards. Just you can apply your common sense to evaluate this you know, validity of the database. It clearly shows that this database it is not at all representative. There is some serious error in reporting and estimation. So I cannot use this database at all to make estimates of poverty. But it, we have been merely making estimates of poverty. So right from the day we got independence. Okay, let me just say, um, uh, Dr. Shija, how much time I have? Hello. Sir, you can continue, sir. You can take as much as time you want. You know, in fact, okay, well, I'm telling you, I've got several slides, but I think I will just have only one. Yeah, you can continue, sir. Okay. You tell me when this time is up, you tell me. Okay. I will stop it because I have, I have got many interesting examples to show, share with the students. Okay, now I will talk to you seven, six, five plan. Fine. You know, generally in all five-year plans, there will be something called base year of the plan. That is, at the beginning of the plan, we, we will try to estimate what is the base year scenario, what is the basic problem facing the country. So I am to look at this slide. What does it show? It shows I'm preparing table. This, this is not my table. I have taken from the fire plan document. Take a little note of the sixth fire plan. What does it show? It was in the base year of the plan was 1979-80. It 
issues the headcount poverty ratio. That is, in the rural India, 50 point, you know, 50 point, 70 percent of the population was living below the poverty line. As by the government number information, more than that is so half half of the population in the rural India was poor. As in regards urban India, look at this number: 40.31 percent. No, it, they're so precise. They have taken even the second decimal place. You know, three one percent of the urban population was poor. The sixth fire plan sought to reduce poverty partly by growth. They said, okay, we'll improve, improve the national income. I mean, we'll improve the national mean consumption in rural India almost by fifteen percent during the fire plan period. That is between the seventy nine eighty and eighty four eighty five, and something by something like eleven point three four percent in urban India. By growth alone, we'll reduce poverty in rural poverty from 50% to 40% in rural, rural India and from 40% to 33% in urban India. The plan also worked out by redistribution that means we will tax the rich, take them, take income away from the rich, and in terms of subsidies, we'll reduce the poverty of the poor. So this is what is called redistribution strategy. The government wanted to reduce poverty partly by growth and partly by redistribution. So what is that? We will change inequality. We reduce inequality something like 28 percent between the first term, beginning of the five-year plan and the end of the five-year plan in rural India, and something like nine percent in urban India. And finally, we would like to achieve poverty, reduce poverty to 30 percent in both rural and urban. This is the great celebrated six-year plan. Fine. Let me just ask you. No one raised the questions, and the government I went ahead. But the tragedy is that government could be, government wanted to reduce poverty to thirty percent in five years, but even after twenty five years, it took more than twenty five years for the government to reduce poverty. Finally, the government poverty in India, rural India, declined to twenty eight percent in two thousand four two thousand five, not in eighty four eighty five. In urban India, poverty declined to twenty five point seven percent in two thousand four two thousand five. This is the tragedy of policy making here. Okay, this is just a policy making exercise. Let us see. Now you are students of economics. We have learned some statistics. Let us see how do you go about validating all these estimates? Is the government really serious? Is it possible to reduce inequality? Okay, government. If you look at the sixth fire plan, they said that yes, government can do that. Inequality. No, it made it. Estimates of the Lawrence ratio, which is a measure of inequality, show that inequality in India, in the rural India, declined at the rate of 0.38 percent per annum. Inequality in urban India declined at the rate of 0.59 percent per annum. So I'm going to show you. This is the uh, photocopy of the planning planning fire plan. Say technical note of the sixth fire plan. This is the table. Table A.3.3. The government of India has simply planning commission has simply reproduced these tables and said that. Poverty, rural inequality, has, inequality in rural India has declined at the rate of 0.38 percent, and urban India at the rate of 0.59 percent. So, what is this evidence? Just to show that the government is very rational. You know, government strategy for growth with redistribution power, power reduction, it is a wise and valid strategy. This table forms the backbone of the sixth fire plan of the government of India. So, how do you do uh, examine whether it's correct or not? There are different ways of uh, asking these questions. One thing is that is statistically, can I look at you know, what the government planning commission did was if it did a regression for these Lawrence ratios and try to find out a trend decline in Lawrence ratio for both the rural and urban India. The question, my question is, can I fit a trend function? Are these Lawrence ratios comparable? They are not comparable. Do you know why? The NSS gives you. Data in the form of you know, this, you know, in, in this manner: size distribution of consumption, export of different expenditure classes. Those with the monthly per capita consumption of less than eight rupees, eight to eleven rupees, eleven to thirteen rupees, etc. It gives you population per percentage of population in each of these class intervals. It gives you their per capita expenditure also. For example, in this one, I have given uh, metropolitan cities of India. So what is equal? You can see that different unequal class intervals. The moment you have unequal class intervals, there is what is called a grouping bias. So you are under underestimation. So this is precisely what happens. 
when you, you prepare a Lorentz curve, this is the grouping bias. And larger the class or class intervals, the larger the grouping bias. Only because of such grouping bias, we find that inequality has declined. For instance, I want to give you one more data set for 1970-71. In this, for this data set, almost half of the population in the topmost exponential curves. That is, actually, for half of the population, you don't have any information about consumption distribution. In other words, I'm giving you these elementary details of statistics just to tell you that don't think that policy formulation, policy evaluation, and policy exercises, they are simple mechanical econometric exercises. Our academic literature is fully full of such blind econometric exercises. It is very important for you to have a good understanding of those techniques. In other words, what these graphs tell is that this planning commission has a major, committed a major blunder, and uh, this table is nonsense. This played the table displayed in the technical note on the sixth fire pen is nonsense. It is nothing but a, a invalid exercise. In other words, there is no basis for us to, the government would be able to reduce poverty by a redistributive strategy. In fact, it's completely proved. For example, if you look at this table, you can see that government could not achieve this entire, achieve this target Target at a poverty level of 30 percent by in the, by the year 1984 85. It took almost 25 years. In five years, the government couldn't do it anything, either by growth. This redistribution did not happen at all. You know, these are simple, some some numerical exercises which the planning commission did. Most academicians also keep doing such exercises. Very important for you for you to have a good understanding of statistical methods. What do they mean? How do we use these techniques? Okay. Now let me provide you the climax of this. Okay, I told you that all these estimates are meaningless because they were on grouping bias, etc. Now I'm going to ask the most fundamental question, which none of the Indian academicians asked the, ask the Panic Commission. For instance, you should ask how did they get this number? 50.7% poverty in rural India in 1979-80 and 40.31%. Where did they get this number? Satyasai Baba did not give them. I mean, no magician gave this number. The government did not conduct any survey. So how did the government give, give, get these numbers? Where is the information base? This is essentially you know, the great public policy failure or the public policy debates also. You know, this is the simply an you know, artificial creation of some tables which do not make any sense. In fact, if you go through our successive five-year plans, we precisely what we find. Misna abuse of statistical tools. People don't know how to apply this to. People simply don't know how, what is the difference between a bar diagram and a histogram. Just ask yourself, how many of you know what is the difference between a bar diagram and a histogram? Ask yourself the question, how do you compute the average growth rate? Suppose growth rate is increasing, and you know, the, the, the growth rate in the first year is 5%, second year 6%, third year 7%. How will you compute every growth rate? Most of our experts don't know. Go through our five year plans. They don't know. So I can give you examples like this. So, so I can get, uh, keep on. I've got several other illustrations. Maybe I think I, um, I can give you several examples of our policy failures. What sort of debates have, have been, we have been having? For instance, after the reform, after since the reform, we have been having now, for example, the 11th fire plan, 12th fire plan. That is for inclusive growth. The planning commission never defined what is inclusive growth. It is the UNDP which advocated inclusive growth. But the UNDP itself finally confessed that it's a million dollar question. We don't know what is inclusive growth. But we have formulated two fire plans without defining inclusive growth. This is the problem, tragedy of policy making in India. Again, you must have heard about the National Food Security Act. What is food security? Has the government defined what is food security? What is the concept? What is the method? How would you estimate food security? What are the estimates? The government of India or the planning commission or the Economic Advisor Council to the Prime Minister, they have not defined any such concept or method or any number. 
what we have here because our, our parliament has part of the positive food security act you might have seen hundreds of articles in all leading newspapers on food security and what's happening to your population etc this is the tragedy of public policy debates in india so dear students you know, i tell you wake up please understand you know the, the concepts methods very very carefully and can do that i can give a number of examples okay it's almost four o'clock i think uh, i would like you to come out and ask me questions so the, I, but i'll just give you give you a couple of more examples to show what sort of policy mistakes we have been making for instance we may have also heard about after the reform program the government wanted to reduce fiscal deficit of the government of, of the government of india they found that one important reason for fiscal deficit is type 2 error that means those don't receive any benefit from the government of india they get benefits for instance public distribution system even the richer sections of the society get benefit so how do you do that how do you ensure that only poor people consume how do you remove the richer you know, Uh, reduce the entitlement of the richer sections of the population. This is what's called type two error. So different experts uh, make different suggestions. Particularly non, as you know, our non-resident Indian experts they are full of advice for us. They just don't have any idea what are the problems. In you know any in any public policy exercise is to first understanding is to have good understanding of the problem of the patient. The patient may be in economy, or it may be real patient for a who has approached a doctor. But you know, our non-resident Indian experts, they're sitting in Harvard or Cornell. They write, make, they're full of advice for us. What we should do and everything. So some of two leading experts they suggested that you know, stop supplying rice and wheat under the public distribution system. Rice and wheat are consumed largely by the rich people. Poor people don't consume rice and wheat. Poor people consume only those cereals like jowar, bajra, etc. But the thing is, they're ill-informed. If you look at the latest NSS estimates of consumption distribution, you find that it is the rich who consume the inferior cereals like jowar, poor cereals like jowar and bajra. They are diet conscious. They are health conscious. They know they know that the cereals, poor cereals like jowar, bajra, nutritional are much richer than rice and wheat. It is the poor people who, with improvement in income, have shifted out of poor cereals and started consuming rice and wheat. So, if you look at the latest estimates of NSS data, you can see that. The rice and wheat are largely consumed by the poor people, not the rich people. But our non-resident Indian experts sitting abroad, sitting in U.S. universities, they advise on the stop supplying rice and wheat, supplying only poor cereals. If the government really follows such advice, it would have ended up serving the only needs of the richer sections of the society. In other words, quite often it is very important for us to have a good understanding of the patient. The problem the patient is suffering from, it may be Indian economy or it may be real patient. So this is the, so that's why I told you we have a food security act. We just don't even know what is food security defined. So this is an important problem. So and I have many other important issues here, and we didn't we for have a food security act without defining food security, and uh, we don't know how to interpret the average also you know, and um, quite often many experts you know even in Indian university leading. National University they went on telling that average consumption has declined in India. Hence, they said that poor people are suffering. But poor people are not suffering at all. Look at this, you know, this data. You know, I have plotted the cereal consumption in rural India for the poorest sections as well as richer sections. It is the richer section who reduce the cereal consumption. For the poorest sections of this rural India, cereal consumption has increased. And for urban India also, the same story. And if you look at the calorie intake also, poor the, for the poor sections, for example, like I say, this blue dark blue line, it refers to this calorie intake of the poorest ten percent of the rural population in India. In India, it is their calorie intake decline. The calorie intake has increased from some something like thousand two hundred to thousand five hundred, no, almost by twenty five percent. Whereas it is the richest sections who have reduced their calorie intake. So, in other words, you know, there is a simple rule in statistics saying that you know you can use mean based estimates of consumption. For interpretation and inferences about the population, only when the population distribution is normal or equally distributed. But people don't bother. People just take any numbers and start estimating. So this is the kind of policy exercises we are having. Okay. And I have given many examples. So let me just uh, give you some more examples. Okay, I think I will skip, skip all this. Uh, and if you look at the latest economic survey, 
Bazı şeyler zikredin ama bir çok çok kalın ama ंग्रेंस This is precisely what is happening in our public policy exercise in India. So, and uh, I would like to conclude with, uh, with reference to, by drawing your attention to just a couple of mistakes um, reported in our economic survey. So, this you might have heard about the economic survey of the government of India in 2012-13. It is full of concepts, you know, different technical concepts, mathematical, statistical concepts, estimates, etc. But doesn't know what it is talking about. For instance, I'll give you some. I've just given some numbers here. For instance, this economic survey for the year 2012-13, it comments India's achievement in human development. I quote: a growth rate in average annual HDI (Human Development Index) of India between 2011 and 2011. It is one of the highest in the world. Okay. Now, what are the mistakes here? There is nothing called average annual Human Development Index. human development index is a cost of concept it is not that you have my monthly or daily estimates and you take an average there is nothing called average annual or monthly human human development index so in other words this is like a doctor who doesn't know what the what is the problem of the patient this is precisely what is the public policy failure in india again this you all as most of you students may be knowing what are these human development scores Growth rates in these schools don't make any sense. Fine, I'll give you some more examples. It also presents estimates of annual average decline in poverty between different years. There is a difference between average annual decline and annual average decline. What the Planning Commission or the NSS provides you are estimates of poverty for the full year. There is nothing called monthly estimates or something nss estimates of consumption refer to the annual estimate of consumption average annual e consumption per year so we have estimates of poverty only for year okay so i can only compare estimates of poverty for different years and talk about annual average decline okay And um, for the average annual decline, and not the annual average decline. So, you should, when we have annual average decline, when you have monthly estimates or daily estimates or weekly estimates, then you compute an average. We don't have such estimates. We have estimates of consumption for the total for the year. In other words, look at this again. I want to give you this is how policies are made in our country. People don't know what is the patient's problem. Okay, now I'm going to give a final interest example. If you look at the same economic survey of the year for the two thousand year for the year two thousand twelve thirteen, it gives estimates of inequality, income inequality in India. There's a full chapter. It talks about in various in what is the extent of inequality in India for different countries, and writes paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. It provides measures inequality in terms of what is called Gini ratio. But does our doctor know what is Gini ratio? Look at I'm just I'm, I put in quotes. I've simply taken from the economic survey. It defines Gini ratio as the deviation of the distribution of income or consumption among individuals or households within a country from a perfectly equal distribution. I'm taking it from the Government of India Economic Survey Report, published in the year 2013, page number 273. This definition is wrong. in other words the policy maker who formulated a policy doesn't even know what is inequality how it is measured how it is defined but here it a full chapter on inequality in fact what i want to tell you is this definition is simply plagiarized from the undp report in other words this is how policies are made or country you know it is very important to have a good understanding of the concepts methods interpretations how to interpret them 
if you don't have then we'll have pers perverse set of recommendations perverse like the way so stop supplying rice and wheat in the public distribution system it is only the you know, rich people who consume rice and wheat poor people don't consume it's a wrong information people don't even know the patient's problem so i mean you know, there was what i'm telling you so if you look at our entire policy making exercise in india regularly we find debates and debates and debates on the magnitude of the problem it could be poverty or it could be food insecurity it could be regional backwardness it could be interregional disparities we have different types of policy assessments prescriptions and finally debates part of a we debate is it a success is it a failure but people keep on writing articles and articles whether it could be in epw it may be some leading national and international journals also. most often they don't make any sense this is also otherwise you know what in other words i would like to make an appeal to all the students here and try to understand the concepts methods and the estimators very very carefully and let's see how you can apply them in addressing public policy questions in our own country on in your own state or it may be in your own city of trivandrum you can play a very important role towards promotion of welfare for the society and for the country for country in general okay i think with this i will stop uh, stop my presentation and uh, i welcome you to ask me any question or a comment on any part of my discussion if something is not clear you are welcome to ask me questions okay i'll stop it here thank you so thank you sir ppt okay thank you sir sites and interesting examples now it's time for discussion anybody interested in asking questions please feel free to ask him questions or else you can post the questions in the chat box i'll read it out what happened you are not responding feel free don't think that you know um, you, you may be asking a silly question feel absolutely free to ask me any question once upon a time i was also like you do you know my background i was a student of history and political science i didn't know any mathematics in fact my first question to my teacher radha krishnan was what is n plus n i i was wondering whether two alphabets can be added n plus n that was my question to so 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 don't think that feel free to ask me any question if otherwise assume that i will get like a good economic i will end up assuming that i have i have not been able to communicate my ideas clearly to you feel absolutely free to ask me any question sir i think we will give them time by that time i would like to ask you a question sure 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 i don't know if this is uh, directly connected to your um, lecture but recently the world happiness report came out and mm -hmm. india ranked 139 out of uh, 149 countries as you know sir but uh, in the beginning you had said that uh, the inability uh, to attain minimum level of economic welfare uh, mm -hmm. is how you defined poverty and okay. connected welfare and happiness mm -hmm. so uh, is this uh, uh, ranking of india in world mm -hmm. happiness report uh, uh, truly only a matter of economics in india is it uh, because of the economic inabilities of a majority of people in our country no no you see sir, you, you, these two are totally non comparable you see the, uh, um, when you are talking about you know ha ha happening in index the indicators that we use are different for instance when i talk about economic when i say the poverty i define no it is not my definition of poverty let me tell you it is a standard internationally accepted definition of poverty is that if we call somebody poor if he is incapable of attaining minimum level of economic welfare the question is what is the minimum level of economic welfare how do you measure it you may measure it in terms of income but in in india we measure it in terms of consumer expenditure when it comes to okay as you are the happening index the indicators that you use are totally different in india when you make estimates of poverty we use actual consumption bundle 
Okay, when you talk about you know, you know, poverty line, what is the minimum poverty consumption bundle? We anchor it in terms of calorie intake. This is what we do. So when it comes to the happening index, whatever the, other, whatever the ranking you give, they totally, you know, they use indicators and criteria which are uniformly applicable to all countries in the world. Here, when you talk about poverty in India, I've just taken only simple NSS estimates of consumption distribution, which are comparable across, only across, across states in India. So in, this, in some sense, I cannot, that way, I cannot really compare these two numbers. Okay, that, that they refer to totally different animals. Uh, yes, sir. Different issues. Okay, yeah. Uh, so one of the parameters were uh, there's a GDP per capita. That's why. Yes. Exactly. Okay, I understand. I know that you know yeah, that's true. But in the, when we talk about um, estimates of poverty, um, uh, we don't have uh, we we make a, don't make estimates of poverty based on GDP. What is GDP? G GDP is gross domestic income generated in the country. Okay, it cannot. I can tell. It doesn't tell us anything about income distribution. So, for instance, when we talk about poverty. Generally, in India, we make estimates of poverty based on actual consumption distribution because the concept of income is not defined. We do not have estimates of income distribution in India. Fine. In India, we do not have estimates of income distribution. But okay, if you look at some of the economic surveys, they talk about inequality, income inequality in India. Let me tell you, in India, till today, we do not have estimates. We have, have not collected, we have not published estimates of income distribution. Of course, some private individuals have collected. National Council of Applied Economic Research has conducted two surveys, sometime in 1962-63 and 1964-65, and then again sometime in 1967-68. A couple of years, they made estimates of uh, income collected information on income distribution, which are not comparable. There are serious problems of definition, concepts, estimates, and etc. But in general, if we talk about income distribution, we don't have any data on income distribution. But even if you look at even this economic survey 2012-13 or several other economic surveys, they talk about in income inequality in India. Where do we get this income inequality? Okay, so what I'm, let me tell you, so that is even we don't have, because defining and measuring and estimate income in a country like India, where a substantial part of the economy is informal, even today, there are remote regions, particularly if you know, even in the state like Maharashtra, which is supposed to be one of the most urbanized states and industrial states, we have a good section of the number of rural, rural economy, which is informal. Where pay, pay payments are in kind of for them. For a teacher like me who gets paid in terms of cash, you know, for whom salary goes, gets paid to his account, I can clearly say what is my income. But somebody who gets paid in cash or somebody you know, who that may be paid or exchange water, everything, so, you know, defining income is impossible. That is why in India we have never made an attempt to estimate income distribution, define and estimate income distribution. We don't have estimates of income distribution at all. At best, we can have state-wise estimates of gross domestic product, what you call state domestic product. That's all we can have. So that will be, give you information about state-wise performance. It won't give us any information about individual's welfare level. What is the individual? What is his uh, participation? What is his progress in terms of poverty? How far the government has succeeded in reducing its um, the deprivation? These issues I cannot ad um, address in terms of G estimates of GDP. So this this one from fundamental differences you have to keep in mind. But most often we don't care about these details. We just write papers. We fit regressions. If you look at the entire literature on trickle down debate. I don't know some of you students or those who are doing research or PhD, and you must be knowing that people simply mechanically apply and estimate regressions and write trickle down debate, trickle down debate, etc. It's absolute nonsense, you know. That's what I would like to tell you. So, a very careful understanding and careful appreciation of statistical and economic techniques is the need of the hour in any public policy exercise and debate. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So one more doubt, as you have mentioned about uh, the data or survey done by private agencies, while we do research or do some papers, we are strictly advised to stick to government data uh, rather yeah. than 
working on private agencies or the data collected by uh, NGOs. So what's your yeah. take on that? No, no, it depends upon you know, your purpose. Okay, it's absolutely true. The, the, the understanding is that generally there is a general perception, which is not really true, that the government agencies follow strict valid rules, statistical procedures. So, and uh, these are verifiable. They are examined by expert, you know, very, for example, the court will go for almost for every issue, for example, this national sample survey data before any data collection, uh, before any survey, the government appoint a committee of experts. For instance, you, you this Tendur committee report, Rangarajan committee report. Rangarajan committee consisted of some, some academic, eminent academic experts. Similar Tendur committee consisted of eminent academic experts. Before Tendur, sometime in 1976, there was this Laklawala committee report. It also consisted of eminent experts. Uh, some of them are teachers from the Center for Doctor and late Professor Vijayanathan was a member of the Laktavala Committee Report. He was uh, you know, these uh, academic experts participate, they define, they think, and verify, they authenticate, they certify. You know, they, they, finally, when the report comes, you can see their signature at the end of the report. The of the report. Essentially, it shows that you know, these all, uh, academic experts have carefully verified and authenticate the report. So these, these are valid estimates. You can use them for your policy analysis. That's the general impression. That's the reason whenever you do research, teachers always advise you to use published reports of the government of India, either government, state government of India or state governments or any other government agency. For the National Sample Survey, it's an essentially data collecting agency of the government of India. Or government of India has a department called Department of Statistics. Okay, and it has different divisions. So. We always think that such information you know, estimates are reliable. But the question, as I already told you, even the national sample survey data estimates of consumption distribution, they are not reliable. As the estimates of consumption distribution, I cannot use them to make estimates of poverty. But there is a general perception. Okay, fine. But you know, can it, can it NGOs or individuals for, for, it depends upon the scale of you know, the scale of the scale of the question that you address? For instance, I know when I was a student at Karivatam in 1976, 78. Many of my young uh, seniors, I, I had my friend's uh, senior, um, Sri Sanjeev Kumar, who used to um, work for Professor M. A. Uman, and he used to, I still remember him going to Varkala and collecting uh, households. Uh, so he, because he was trying to uh, examine impact of the Gulf you know, OPEC boom, the Gulf boom, you know, what is the impact, as you know, all the, um, a lot of my migrants from here, from a lot of my, my household from uh, villages like Varkala or even Malapuram, uh, in districts of Malapur, everything they migrate to uh, the, in, in, in countries in, in, the, in the Gulf and a lot of remittances. So, as a result, the poverty declined. So, um, there are many studies, many experts like Professor Uman conducted studies. What is the impact of the Gulf boom on the Kerala economy, on the Kerala village economy, like you know, Varkala, etc.? So, then in such a context, what people do is my, um, so some you know, the professor M. O. Mani conducted several surveys in Varkala at different points of time and tried to see what is the impact, what is the, what has happened to the income earnings, what has happened to the economic status defined in terms of you know uh, asset hold ownership defined in terms of consumption etc. So in such a context, people follow their own standard rules. What is important for you as a researcher is to see. Have they followed standard statistical procedures? Have they used some proper sampling frame? What is the sampling frame? What is the sampling design they use? What is the sampling methodology they use? What sort of questionnaire? Do they have valid statistical concepts? So these are the questions that you do. Quite often, what I can say is, I know, I, I know generally people are uh, all these NGOs, they consult experts, I agree. But you know, quite often, what happens is, you know, um, Students just go and collect some certain information. No one knows what they are. It also happens. I don't know what to say. That quite often I have come across situations when the the student doesn't know what he has collected. Why to apply students? It has happened even the national sample survey. Look at the, 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 the national sample survey data on two, three, for the year 2004, 2005. It shows that even the richest households have BPL cards. How would you explain this? Imagine, can you imagine Dhirubhai Ambani or something? I am just giving an example to Tendulkar, Nayana Murthy, all these people are having BPL cards. 
In other words, you know, there are many anomalies in almost some of these uh, NSA, even national sample survey research. So just because whatever I, as a researcher, as a teacher, what I would tell you, you know, it is very important for you to carefully authenticate the information base. Just because it is something from comes from the NGO, just because something from, from Saudi Arena, don't rubbish it. At the same time, just because something from, from the government of India, planning commission, or the national sample survey, just don't think that is a valid, holy, you know, um, so acceptable research. As I should, as I told you, for example, in this technical note in six fire plan, it committed a major blunder. It makes estimates of Lawrence ratio for different years and for education. Estimates of Lawrence ratio, various around group data are not comparable at all. It is a simple statistical rule which your teacher will tell you. But look at our technical not a six file plan. They have mercilessly fitted the regression. They found that the inequality in India has been declining. We can't make any such inference. This also, just because something has published in the planning commission report, don't think it is correct. Similarly, I told you, economic survey 2012 13, one of the highly, highly most applauded with the public policy exercise. Again, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't even know what is a Gini ratio. So, in other words, what I would like to tell you, you know, pay attention to what is taught in your class, try to understand them, and apply those, whatever you learned in your reading, understanding of public policy debates in the country, and try to participate. That's how you, make a, you can make a very important contribution to public policy exercises in the country, is what I would say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. Send me a question. Okay. Okay. One more question. Uh, it's from Mr. Cherry Ajun. Some experts consider the emphasis on statistics in economics as bogus. They claim yeah. data uh, is far away from reality. But mm -hmm. from a different point of view, I think mm -hmm. decentralization makes circumstances for collecting data and interpreting it. If mm. and etc. are collected and distributed locally, will this complicated business arise? Okay. You know, those who make this kind of comments, so saying that, you know, rubbish you know, official statistics, it is misleading. There's also, they're also ill informed. At the same time, those who say that oh, all these statistics are great and I can, they're also ill informed. For a researcher, for a student of, student of public policy, for a student of statistics, what is important is to have a good understanding of the concept. Imagine, I always, this is whenever I teach economics to my students, I always give some nice example. I tell you, a barber has a pair of scissors. A tailor, he also has a pair of scissors. A cobbler has also a pair of scissors. Finally, a surgeon also has a pair of scissors. Imagine somebody has to be operated upon, has to undergo surgery. Do you think a barber will, will be able to solve his problem? No, he will simply kill the patient because he knows neither theory nor anatomy. Only he has a pair of scissors. Similarly, a cobbler or a tailor, they will simply kill the patient. It is only a surgeon who knows theory, who knows anatomy. He knows where to cut, what to cut, and how to go about his exercise you will be able to save the patient. Same logic applies to even our statistical tools or econometric tools or economic concepts. It is very important to, for us to use how to use, when to use, and in, in what context to use. Otherwise, you will simply, I told you quite all this over fire plan, six fire plan strategy or the economics of it, it's all the rubbish. I'm really as surprised. No, these are very, you know, if you just go and look at it, these are very great experts who are prepared. But they are nothing but jokes. So it is for that question, I can't rubbish them. They are very important. Just because a tailor will commit, you know, kill a patient, you don't go, it's not that you know, I, you know, rule, rule out surgery. I have to go to an appropriate expert. I should go to a surgeon who knows both theory and anatomy. Similarly, most of the econometrics and statistical tools had to be used with care and understanding. They're not mechanic, even simple arithmetic mean. People mechanically use it. You just use any, look at any public policy paper. People say, 
Maharashtra is the richest state in terms of per, per capita income in the country. But if you look at poverty, it is the poorest state in the country. Almost 60, 70% of the population in Maharashtra is poor. How do you reconcile these two numbers? If I use per capita estimates, if I see it is the richest state. No, this is, the problem is that, you know, I can't use per capita estimate is a mean based estimator. On that basis, I can't generalize the economic status you know, of the whole population in Maharashtra. If I want to really look at the distribution of uh, population status, I have to look at the distribution of profile. You see, in other words, you should know how to use statistics. Very, very careful understanding of theory and the concepts is very, very important. But just because I don't know theory or because I can't just say that, you know, it is rubbish. This is precisely what happens in some sort quite often on public policy literature. Okay. So you know, don't say that it is rubbish. You know, try to under, uh, understand and apply the tools with care. This is what I would suggest. Okay. Is there any other question? I thought somebody else wrote a question, sir. Yes, sir. We have two more questions. Okay. Uh, this question is by Ms. Adria Ajay. Regarding recent debate over the global hunger index, the government raised questions on the validity of India's low ranking based on the findings of NFHS. What's your take? Yeah, that's true. You know, we can always uh, um, uh, write these uh, questions. You know, I know quite often whenever something is not accept acceptable, something is not convenient, we always say this is not reliable. You know, this is, uh, it is true. What happens, you know, when you, when you, it depends upon who makes these estimates. You know, as you know, for example, the Global Hungry Index is done, estimated, estimates are made by the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. What they do is some of these, you know, so they, sometimes they do not have complete information for all countries. Sometimes what they do is they may just wait. For example, you did ask me how did the six five plan make this uh, estimate of poverty for the year 1979-80 when there was no data. And you know, quite often they make estimates of poverty like that. For instance, let me tell you, give an example. I was working for the government of Nepal some, sometime, some, sometime in 2004. I was working, looking into the, the planning commission, how fire plans are formulated, higher formula, plan strategies are formulated, etc. Then I found that the base year of the 12th fire plan for Nepal was uh, if I remember, it is something, something 2000 to 2002, and the incidence of poverty was 38%. Okay. The government wanted to, government of Nepal or the planning commission of Nepal wanted to reduce poverty from 38% to 30% in five years. Okay. So in, 90, in the base year, 90, was 90, 2002, poverty was 38%. In 2004-2005, World Bank gave a massive assistance to the government of Nepal. They conducted a survey and they made estimates of poverty for Nepal in 2004-2005. They found that poverty in 2004-2005 in Nepal has already declined to some 34% 30, or something. So how do you say that? Then, that means in a matter of two years, do you think poverty declined from 38% to 32%? If you look at the Indian policymakers, whether it's one of these Congress or any politician, they would have immediately clap. They would say, oh, poverty, we have such a, our planning is such a great success. Poverty declined from 38% in 2002 to 32, 32 or 34% in 2004. I was surprised. Then I said, where did you get this number? 38% in 2002. Do you know what did they say? No, I said, you have not conducted any survey. Where did you collect this data from? Do you know what they said? Oh, no, no, we didn't have any data. So, no, we just looked at our neighbor. No, Nepal's neighbor is Bihar. We found the government of India estimates of poverty for Bihar is 8%. Oh, we, we assumed that we are as rich or as poor as our neighbor. So, they simply assumed that the Bihar number for the this is a kind of exercise, no? But you know, in many countries, we have people do all this kind of, when they don't have information, they do this kind of tricks. It's something assured. Similarly, it is not, notably about the global hunger index. Many, for instance, long back, World Bank used to come out with estimates of poverty line. 
for many countries they didn't have estimates of poverty line at all they just assume they look at their labor and assume that it's a poverty line for the states even in india we used to follow for the state for, for for many for many years we just used the poverty line for maharashtra for goa also and the number of estimates of poverty whatever you observe for maharashtra we assume the same thing for goa also simply in the northeast we generally we have representative national sample survey for us so whatever you find observe for masha we thought that it seems all good for tripura and so these are the principles of statistical convenience we follow but you know it is very important for you as a student for you as a researcher to be careful how do we get these numbers how do you know are, are they valid are they comparable these are very very important so before you use all these published statistical estimates it could be published from the government of india or planning commission it could be some ngo as a researcher it is very important for you to understand the concept technique and method of estimation and interpretation okay, that's how we should go about it fine okay Okay, somebody else has some other question. Well, I hope you have time to engage two more questions. Yes, yes, sir. No, I am free. Don't. Have... Right, sir. So, next question is by Sri Lakshmi. Uh, yeah. Don't think that there is an unnecessary emphasis given to statistical data in studies, even though they are important. If there are two thousand poor people in a nation in real, and mm -hmm. there was only hundred poor, are there mm -hmm. in a nation such as? a huge data gap can't offer a proper solution to the problem of poverty mm -hmm. that's a question sir so we will repeat it i think i missed some part so we will repeat it uh, sir don't you think there is an unnecessary emphasis given to statistical data in studies even mm -hmm. though important mm -hmm. even though even, even though, though they are important yes they are important I agree i'm glad yes. that you're saying yes they are very important yes Uh, but she has also given an example. If there are two thousand poor people in a country, the data shows only hundred of them. Mm. Such data gap can't mm. offer a proper solution to the problem of poverty. Yeah, it is not get, get data gap. Essentially, that means it's, there is some information uh, failure in collecting information. Okay, quite often what we do is you don't conduct a census survey. For imagine, I want to make estimates of poverty in India. We don't collect information for the entire one billion population. Now so today our Indian population is one point three or one point four billion billion. Okay, we don't collect information. We take a representative sample, and we okay. So the, how representative is this sample? What is the error? Sampling error. These are important the things we have to consider. We have to worry about. Otherwise, if you don't do that, then you have all as you said. Okay, actual people, the number of poor people will be two thousand. We will find that only thousand, hundred people are poor. It is true because of you know it's failure in this you know, working out the strategy for sampling. I get, I commit this kind of. Okay, um, you know a cobbler will kill the patient. You don't say that. Okay, Caesar is useless. Who know? But no, what is important is how I carefully use it. How can I carefully use these techniques? It's so that which I can use for policy. This is what happens. You know, for instance, I give you this example of Lawrence ratios. Lawrence ratios based on different NSS rounds are not comparable at all. But our planning commission, our our noble or planning commission, simply put it across a table, fits a regulation, not only planning commission. All hundreds of experts, national and international academic experts, have fitted regulations to these Lawrence ratios. All you know, professors not from it is not from Sudan and from Kasar Gold. It is even professors, a highly reputed professor from Cornell University. They made estimates of poverty from which we can't make estimate. We cannot use NSS data to make estimates of poverty. Okay, this is my 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 stand on the NSS data. But the question is. Even this eminent expert from Cornell University, they fitted regulation published in international journals. So, what is the my suggestion is that careful use of it may be a pair of scissors, it may be statistical tool. That is what is advocated today. What I advocate today to you is that you know don't rubbish. Yes, I agree. There, you know what you suggest is statistics important, but you know <laughs> there are errors in my handling of statistics. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah thank you sir uh, okay. could you please mute your mic fine Moni? 
Hello, Muni, could you please mute your mic? Okay, sir. Uh, uh, okay, I thought you were telling me. Yeah. Tell me, is there uh, any more question? Yes, sir, there are two more questions. Yeah, yeah, no uh, problem. Okay, initial outbreak of COVID has equally affected everyone. Mm -hmm. Lot more people were pushed to poverty, unemployment raised, but in 2020, cumulative wealth of 828 Indians mm -hmm. increased from $140 billion to $820 billion. And mm -hmm. what we saw was the sudden revival of stock market and some mm -hmm. Indians. Is it due to policies taken by the government or is it due to market forces in the economy? This question is by Surya. Okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are a number of factors. More than government policies, what is the international situation that has really, for example, the boom in the stock market. Essentially, largely what is happening in you know, all these um, particular countries, countries like the US and all the European countries. At least, you know, um, England also, you must be knowing, our own Indian finance minister, um, you know, how, how, how such a liberally policies formulated in America also, the government wanted to really revive the economy. Because of the liberal spending and the release of you know, resources, they, as a result, you know, we can see a lot of resources from, from a portfolio in source to Indian country and people making investments in Indian stock market. Precisely what happened as recent countries, it has been booming right from day one, actually. Of course, there was, there was a collapse sometime in the last year, March, March 20th, around so that time. But of course, it is booming and every day. Isn't it? These are speculative market forces, and you know, much more. I would say much more than the government. Is the government in the international? In the, in the, we are living in a globalized context. You see, so and, and this is what is happening. Sir, okay. yeah. Sir, yes, the last... two, some more questions. He said. What are the other questions? So there is one more last question. Okay. Uh, this is by Surya. Uh, Kerala is the eighth state to complete doing business reforms, but mm -hmm. Kerala's rank in ease of doing business is pushed to 28 in 2020. Why mm -hmm. Kerala's rank declined? Yeah, yeah. that could be you know, a number of uh, reasons, like institutional reasons, etc. Imagine you always take it, the Kerala always ranks first in terms of human doubt index. In terms of literacy, Kerala is, you always say, say that Kerala is a particular. Literacy is raised is hundred percent, etc. But you know, virtually look at virtually in terms of domestic economy and domestic economic development. Okay, Kerala is still doing badly. It's only because of this globalization, international migration. We get more than almost half, fifty percent of this, you know, state income. You know, is from non-resident remit, you know, and NRI remittances, etc. That's what is the state is doing so well. But they look at the otherwise, you know, how would you say, you know, in spite of this great literacy, 100% literacy and traditional first of all, Kerala, in terms of economic performance, uh, or if any other, you know, look at the standard of education also. Look at our own, let me talk about our own age. Economics, yeah, that is, you know, um, look at any department, you know, you have to seriously. Think about and make a serious effort to improve our standard of education. Isn't it? How do you explain this? In spite of this paradox of poverty and plenty, or I don't know. No, it is the most well informed society, I would say, Kerala is. But the question is, you know, what is very what is really preventing it to preventing it from realizing its, realizing its potential. I don't have an answer for that. How do you explain this? In terms of any sphere, either in terms of um, education standards or in terms of economic development, in terms of uh, industrial development, any dimension you look at it, why is Kerala is doing badly? Shall I tell you? No, I think I should not tell you. It's not, it's not a very well pleasant fact. You know, I'm at this Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research right from the day one. Right, you know, I joined here as somebody, I think, as a shadow um, or somebody, I think, as you pointed out. No, no, let me tell you, till now, our intake of students from Kerala has been virtually zero. 
I would have loved to take another such student. Okay, there are students from Kerala who have joined our institute. They all know why. You know, most of them were studied in Saint you know, Stephen's College in Delhi, or some of them studied in Uspani University, or you know, Central Hyderabad Central University, or some of the Madras Christian College, or some of the Madras. Like that, they have come. You know, you know, in terms of you know, direct recruit from Kerala, it has actually been zero. I don't think that. Uh, I, I I don't recall any student coming from Kerala to my Indira Gandhi Institute of Research. You know, for them, if you come to to PhD, we got a fantastic fellowship. We have a wonderful library, a lot wonderful infrastructure, etc. I would have loved to see the students from you know, Kerala coming into my institution. Why do Why do you say? I would have loved to you know help help them in whatever way I can do that. But the question is, somehow it has not happened. How would you explain this? I would say it is the most well-informed society in the country. I am very proud of you know, Kerala, my um, alma mater. In fact, I, my, it is a turning point for in my career at the Department of Economics. So I don't know where what has what has really gone. You know, I think so. All of us have a responsibility towards you know improving our uh, performance in every sphere of activity. This is what I would say. With a clear, good understanding. So, to begin with, as students of economics and students of public policy, I will be able to you students try to understand concepts too. Just because don't just because some people are misusing, some people don't know how to use. Don't rubbish. Try to so, with careful understanding, clarity. You can always participate in debates and make formal policies and make suggestions. This is what I should do. make a beginning like this. Okay, I wish you all the best. Any more questions? So then, last question, uh, okay. which is related to the what you have said right now. Kerala stands for better quality of education, and its spending is high. In the sense that educated unemployment is high in Kerala, but spending yeah. employment generation is low. Will there be a giving an equal preference for both? This question is by Andrew Beskrishan. Mm, I don't think I followed it completely. Uh, so, so last part I missed it. Okay, 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 okay. Tell me. The question is: uh, Will uh, employment generation and the spending on education will be given equal preference in st in the state? No, oh, it, it depends upon public policy understanding. See, I I cannot say anything. Maybe I I can write a paper today, or it depends upon uh, yourself. You know, tomorrow you know you should essentially write public policy paper. That's why I told you. You know, I think uh, I would uh, appeal to Dr. Shridhar and Professor Simon and others that you know I think it should make a beginning in the Department of Economics, Arya term, saying that try to bring out a monthly or weekly newsletter. They may find it difficult. This is for us to start writing uh, just one-page letters or newsletters. Taking up important public policy issues, as okay, as you pointed out, it could be employment generation. It could be, you know, improvement in quality of education, and it could be any 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 of these issues, right? You know, see, so to begin, we can see how different countries have done well. What is the success? Is for example, I mean, Vietnam was doing very badly. I had done work for the government of Vietnam and World Bank, you know, in Vietnam. Until look, can you believe? Till two thousand two, two thousand three, Vietnam did not have any information base. It was doing better in two thousand two, two thousand three. Incidence of poverty was in Vietnam almost something like eighty to ninety percent. But in two thousand two, two thousand three, they liberalized. They completed made massive investments in education. Everything in a matter of five years, it still looks like a dream for me. In the, by two thousand eight, two thousand nine, poverty declined from eighty percent to just twenty percent. Can you believe? And the growth rate of the economy was more than ten percent since two thousand two, two thousand three. Remarkable story. Already, so in other words, you know, in pro appropriate po public policies, you know, we should not get lost in our own political orientation. That's what I would say. We should be very, very pragmatic. We should see, see what is good for our society. What is the right approach we should do it. So this is how we should go about it. So similarly, okay, what I, I would I would suggest, you know, you, know, uh, you should start writing you know, maybe some, you know, newsletters, you know, monthly or uh, depend of economic area, but. DOE Karyatam newsletters or something like this. Students should write every month and write an article on important public policy issues. And just you don't have to write thousands of pages, just 800 words or just one page is enough. Really write what is the issue, 
I, in your understanding, what's really important? Just put it in your website or something. Right? You create an awareness. I think that's what you should do. This is a small beginning. Afterwards, maybe you can have, you know, uh, working papers, anything you do. So I, this is what I would suggest. The debates, the discussion is quite important. Then, you know, you can have, uh, you know, explore the, you know, the fundamentals and come out with the good, good suggestions. We should never dis, you know, know, stop discussion and debate. Okay. Okay. And if you have any other question, you can, you're always welcome. You know, I think your, my email ID is already there. Your teachers have, so you're welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Oh. Uh, the question, sir, uh, sir, I think yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Caste discrimination is very much high in Kerala, and Article 15 prohibits discrimination, but mm -hmm. still the issues persist. What's mm -hmm. your take on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I that's what it is. This essentially was um, uh, some social behavioral attitudes, etc. Um, I, I don't know what exactly you mean because I am also from Kerala. I lived and grew up in Kerala. I never felt like that. Let me tell you, you know, I studied in Trivaka Kariwattam. I was studying in the hostel for two years. I, my room number was 207 in men's hostel. I lived two years, you know, I, I never felt like that. In fact, let me tell you, see, my I am from Kasaragod in Kerala. My mother tongue is, uh, is Kannada. You know, I didn't know Malayalam when I came to Kariwattam. But I had such a wonderful life. All my, you know, my, my Malu friends treated me so well. You know, after that, I also started speaking Malayalam. And, you know, my, my Malayalam was Malabar Malayalam. Very, very bad. See, I never felt that they say I am a non malayali or something. All my, even the department of, in the, in the library, everyone used to be very, very supportive, healthy. I had a wonderful life. I feel nostalgic about my life in Parivartam even today. But, you know, I, 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 I don't know. This caste discrimination in Kerala, I, you know, I find it difficult because, you know, I, my own conviction, my own understanding of perception about Kerala is that it's a well informed, mature society. Maybe I'm biased. I have a very exaggerated opinion about my state. but. I think you know, it's a very mature state. I don't think, maybe I don't, could be possible some outliers in some villages or some parts it could be there, but in general, I don't know. It's really true. But really because, you know, we're such a well-informed, you know, educated society, is it possible? I don't know. So um, if it's really true, there's a need, you know, still, if you think that it's true, there's a need for reform in terms of, you know, reform of att social attitudes, so human behavior, it's not a different cup of limit. Definitely, education will be a critical factor. That's true. I, I, I don't know. You know this part, I, I, I'm surprised to hear this. Could be that uh, I'm not reading Malayalam newspapers regularly. Could be I have missed out this kind of information. Could be you're right. I don't know. I don't want to give misleading information. So, be, but uh, I find it difficult. Let me tell you because it's a well informed society. Kerala is a well educated, mature, well informed society. Okay, any other question? You, know, you, you can disagree with me, no? Okay, just don't uh, keep listening to me. You should argue with me. If, it, if I'm wrong, tell them that, that is the beauty of the academics. Academy is the one place where you can disagree with your teacher, fight and prove your point, and you know, it's very important. That's why I love academics. Always that you should have debate, discuss. Good, fine. Any other question? Or always, you can always, you're always welcome to write to me. Okay, my email is there. Dr. Sridhar has a, my, my email. Uh, she has my WhatsApp number also. Anytime you can call me and talk to me on WhatsApp also. So if you don't, say, I, I, I hope I get I will get a chance. I hope this Lord COVID will permit me to come and visit you all in the Department of Economics in the near future. I would be allowed to come back. I have not come to the department after I left. So I would love to come and meet you all because I would like to see what is this Department of Economics a half a century after me. Now, I was a student in 1976-78. Now it's almost half uh, 50 years, 45 years. I would like to see how is this department now. I wish you all the best. You know, be pragmatic, be optimistic. I know all of you will do well. All the best for you. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to your coming, sir. Okay. Thank you. Right, sir. Uh, as we are moving on to the end, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Anita V, Head, Department of Economics, to propose the word of thanks. Uh, 
Ma'am, please. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. A very warm good afternoon to one and all. So during the last, I think, uh, almost two hour, we have gone through a brainstorming session on an evergreen topic, public policy in India, unmasking the debates. Uh, debates with the support of concepts, issues associated with the measurement database related to the poverty and other cases from uh, economic surveys. Professor uh, Surya Narayana brilliantly proves the tragedy of public policy in India. Thank you, sir, for the classic presentation and wonderful interaction. On behalf of the uh, IQAC, University of Kerala, and the Department of Extent, uh, Economics, I extend our sincere gratitude to you, sir. Now, I, you, extend, now I extend our sincere thanks to Professor Simon, uh, Simon Tattel, Director, IQAC, University of Kerala, for the whole support to conduct this program and the warm welcome speech. I would like to acknowledge uh, the, uh, that the program is the outcome of the relentless work of Professor Shija SR of the department. On behalf of the participant present here, I extend our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Shija. The two other names associated with this webinar are uh, Ms. Sharon Jose, uh, the anchor, and the Jibin Francis, who extended technical assistance to record the session. Now, let me extend our thanks to all my colleagues of the department, particularly Dr. Christabel, and all other participants present here. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the lecture has been dismissed. OK, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome, sir. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shija. Thank you, sir. Okay. It was a nice feeling. Thanks a lot.